Why are you doing five times two? Why are they they want to use this? the magnitude in this sample. They want to use our sample. And they are always asking me, like, uh, uh, put pre putting pressure. Putting pressure. <laughs> 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 like, is it going to be ready for five times two? <laughs> okay, that's the answer. Um, I like your answer. <laughs> yeah, I do too. Sorry, like, no, for conference, you should test one. That is fine. But I, I guess, people, I mean, we should pick it up in our ICT telecom if, if it's not decided. Yeah, just the minimum. Maybe because it's not decided. Yeah, but it's like not decided. Yeah, but it's 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 Really, <laughs> really excited. Yeah, that's crazy. This is great, no? Okay. Yeah. So, so I said we have double duty today. <laughs> so she's giving uh, her third lecture and also the colloquium for the uh, institute. So as I mentioned in the morning, the colloquium is something more general because it's for people that are not in cosmology in general. Uh, in, yeah. So, uh, but of course you, you should come. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there will be some overlap. <laughs> By the way, I'm getting my first gray hair thanks to this uh, thanks busy to schedule. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. I, love, I have a lot of gray hair. <laughs> oh, and my own video. Yeah. I keep forgetting my own video. Okay. <laughs> okay, hi. So um, I think I have to finish up um, FOVAR. And uh, then I'll use whatever we have learned from FOVAR to try to uh, show you what's behind these things that we call test of gravity and uh, what's behind those papers, wherever you see fits of those function, mu, sigma, and whatever, and they tell you they that they are testing modified gravity or dark energy with their data set. And uh, it was sort of all born out of FOVAR and what we have learned in FOVAR. Um, so finishing up FOVAR, those were the questions that I showed yesterday for linear scalar perturbations. Uh, it's the full set of Einstein equation, keeping still uh, the perturbation to the scalaron implicit. Um, and then I told you you can make, well, forget about the pressure one, and then you can make, uh, combine the 0, 0 and the 0, i, the standard way that gives you the Poisson equation. But you have higher uh, order, that, um, and, and it's not an, an algebraic equation. You have higher order things appearing here. You have derivatives. And that's because, uh, that's exactly because we have higher degrees of freedom. We have an extra degrees of freedom in this theory. We can kill those derivatives if we go to this so-called quasi-static regime, which is assuming um, that the gradient, the special gradients of your scalar perturbations are uh, negligible with respect, sorry, are more important than the, any time derivative of um, these potentials. And let me, I had commented about it yesterday already. So you are very used to associate this approximation, quasi-static, with going on sub-horizon scales. So it's very sort of, it's sort of equivalent in lambda CDM eh, to take your uh, wave number to be larger than AH, so you are inside the horizon. And at that point, I mean, yes, with numerics, you can keep the full set of equation, but typically if you want to make progress analytically, you drop all time derivatives uh, that are multiplying your potential. So you, you drop, if you have a term like this <coughs> in your uh, equations, you, it will always be much bigger than terms like this, of course, because we are on sub-horizon, but also of terms like this or these, where these are time derivatives of any type. So in here it's fine. Yeah. In here it's fine. You're using just the fact that you are on sub-horizon. But in here you have the implicit assumption about the time scale over which these potentials are evolving. 
And the fact that you have modified gravity, you have extra degrees of freedom, might inject non-trivial dynamics in the scalar fields, uh, both the one representing, most importantly, the one representing the extra scalar field, is it a scalar or whatever, but in principle also in the metric potentials. So you have to separately make this assumption of being on sub-horizon and then sort of check whether the time derivatives of your uh, scalar, and in particular here I'm showing it for the scalar field uh, representing their energy, they are actually negligible with respect to the special gradients. And there's a couple of things that enters into, into the game, and in particular you can have a new scale, which is not anymore the horizon, but it's the sound horizon scale of the scalar field. So if the sound speed of the scalar field is not one, that can, it's lower than one, that can give you an, an effective new horizon below which your, scalar, uh, your quasi-static regime is valid. So that's very important to check, and uh, we have checked it uh, for FOVR, and it holds well. So we need to do some algebra to go from those equations that I show, the Einstein equation, to where I want to get. And uh, the first thing is that I'm going to open delta F sub R and express it as the second derivative of F with respect to R times delta R. So I'm going to go to the metric variables. And then I'm going to look at the perturbation to the Ricci scalar in Newtonian gauge uh, linear, of course, expansion, Newtonian gauge. Here, primes are conformal, derivatives with respect to conformal time. And this, this is the general expression. I mean, if you need it, take it from a textbook, because for sure I will have some typo. But <laughs> that's more or less the general expression of delta R. And what I'm going to do is uh, I want to work in quasi-static regime, so I'm going to drop all those derivatives. And it's a very simple expression. And that makes the equations that I showed before very simple. And with little algebra, moving things here and there, um, you can still combine them in something that resembles very much what we are used to see in lambda CDM. I keep swapping back and forth from commoving the density contrast and just the density contrast. But we are on sub-horizon, so they're basically equivalent. So yes, yesterday, I think we, uh, uh, I did a quick recap of what happens in lambda CDM. And you would have this Poisson equation relating minus a square to rho delta. All these in red, but also this one over capital F, which, let me remind you, was in my convention where the action is R plus F of R. Capital F was this. So you have a new a bunch of new terms in here. And similarly, uh, there's a sort of effective shear, effective anisotropic stress contributed by your theory um, that uh, acts such, as the, such so that uh, phi and psi are not anymore equal, even if you don't have any shear from neutrinos. Uh, now, how, what is the shape of these two things? Uh, you can see that it's um, the ratio of polynomials that are even a quadratic in k square. Um, so it's something that goes like a coefficient that depends on, depends on times plus b k square. I actually can rescale it to 1 divided by c plus d k square. OK? And uh, that, we will see, is a very general feature of all scalar tensor theories. You don't expect to have even powers of k, sorry, odd powers of k. You would need some vector field in there, some vector degree of freedom. You have scalar fields around. And since we have only one scalar field with second order equation of motion, you don't expect, I'll show uh, later a more general example, but you don't expect to produce anything else than um, a polynomial that is even and quadratic in k square. Uh, so now, uh, of course, the shape that you get is something, if you look, uh, look, for instance, at the part in red, is something that goes from a value of 1 to a value of 4 over 3 at a transition scale, if you're looking at in terms as a function of k, at a transition scale, k over a, which is set basically by that thing there.
sorry, which if you remember yesterday, I said is more or less the mass of the scalaron. So there's no magic behind this. You could have already written it down immediately because it's exactly the Fourier transform uh, that you get when you go from having not only your standard potential, but something with a coupling that in FOVARA I showed yesterday is fixed. It was that square root of two thirds and whatever. And of the Yukawa form. So if you take the Fourier transform of this, uh, you get exactly the ratio of polynomials in k squared. So that's all that you're getting. And that's why uh, is that this is what you see whenever you do scalar tensor theory on linear scales. Uh, there's a little factor in here, 1 divided by 1 plus f sub r, which is often neglected, but uh, it's not so negligible, um, especially if you look at the ISW tail of cosmic microwave background. It's important to have it here, but it's a background effect. It comes from the modification that f of r gives to your background expansion. And then, okay, there is this anisotropic shear. It has, again, a very similar structure. So that's when... Uh, uh, people started to introduce this ratio of polynomials, and there's a famous paper by Bershinger, Ed Bershinger, and uh, the guy that at his time was his student, Philip Zucking, where they argue that um, we can, uh, in principle, make general tests of uh, gravity with large scale structure if we introduce. Uh, two generic functions uh, re relating phi, psi, and delta that are ratio of polynomial in k square. And then, of course, there remains the question of what to do with the time dependence of these objects. In f of r, it's fixed. It's given by the time dependence of your mass scale. The scalaron evolves, starts from, uh, of course, this is a function of time. So it is very high at early times, and then it becomes lighter. Um, so these coefficients will be time dependent. In the original parameterization of Bershinger that was inspired by f of r, it just kept uh, these as power laws in time. Uh, so that you, you will find, uh, if you go back to 2010 and those years, you will find a lot of papers that uh, fit data, large structure data to these things, assuming uh, the b, d, and c are something like a to the s, uh, some power, power law with a couple of different coefficients in front. And they show constraint on S and whatever. It was all inspired by um, F of R. So basically, the way we look at it is that now we have a time and scale dependent rescaling of the Newton constant. And I already uh, said whatever I wanted to say. So you have a sort of transition scale, which is set by the mass of the scalaron. And if you look at it, oh, OK, yeah, next slide. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, as I already said, basically, this is what you generally expect. Uh, you can generalize it to generalize brans -Dickey. And uh, it's what you generally expect when you have this coupling alpha. Um, this is what you're seeing here, the mass of your scalar field and the coupling entering in these coefficients in front. Now, what happens um, then if we keep going? So we have. Still, uh, we have a more complicated set of equations, but they're still algebraic because we have done this approximation of killing all time derivatives. Um, so I can keep going. And um, I haven't touched the action for gravity, for matter, right? Because I've just modified the metric part, the Einstein-Hilbert part. So my continuity and Euler equations will be the usual ones. And as usual, I can combine them in a second order differential equation for delta. Again, where I drop time derivatives of the potentials. And now the only thing that changes is that if I take the Poisson equation here and I substitute what I have found, it will, be sti it will still be a second order homogeneous equation in delta, but with a very uh, complicated coefficient in here. And the first striking thing that you notice as a difference with what I showed yesterday for lambda CDM is that this coefficient is a function of k. So scale is not anymore, so growth is not anymore scale independent. So even when, after a mod enters the horizon, it will have a growth rate that will depend on its wave number. It's not anymore. That's a, the, the first feature. And then, uh, uh, of course, uh, the other thing, if you keep going and solve for the growth rate out of this equation, uh, you will see that it's, that 
consistency relation that was giving me the growth rate as a simple expression of the Hubble expansion is broken. It becomes way more complicated. But I do have sort of two regimes. I can expect that because of these ratio polynomials. I, the way uh, they were written, I do see that both corrections to lambda CDM, at least in the f of our case, goes basically to one on very large scales. And I start picking up the effect only on smaller scales when I go, I enter, I go below the characteristic mass scale of um, the scalar. So uh, let me show you, uh, show that in a, a picture rather than in words. So it looks like a busy picture. Um, let me walk you through. So let us start from the right panel. And here we are looking at a redshift on the horizontal axis. So here we are today. And scale, K, 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 the wave number, on the vertical axis. So here you are on larger scales, and here you are on smaller scales up here. Here I'm showing the evolution of the density contrast divided by A. So in uh, lambda CDM, uh, you, if, if you solve the exercise for the growth rate, you see that uh, delta grows linearly in the scale factor during the matter domination, and then starts slowing down when acceleration kicks in. So the, and then there is scale independence, right? So that's what these colors are telling you. Uh, at each K, you have the same pattern. Uh, you have a constant. This is one, this ratio. A constant, because I've divided by A, right? So matter grows linearly, and then it starts growing less as acceleration kicks in. If you now go to F of R, and this is a designer F of R built with a given mass scale and the lambda CDM background, you see that there is a new scale entering in here. This black dashed line is the mass of the scalar on the scale associated to the mass of the scalar, which is something associated to this choice of F, F sub R is zero. If you change F sub R zero, you will change the position of this dash black line. And in this regime, at earlier times, and in particular at larger scales, you sort of reproduce what you're used to seeing in lambda CDM. But as you go to small, later times and smaller scales, in particular as you cross below the Compton scale, uh, this, this uh, characteristic length scale of your scalaron, then you see uh, changes. The growth is announced, and, the, de and the, 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 the suppression of growth that is due to the acceleration kicking in is uh, milder. So that's what we have learned out of F of R, and just to make it, yeah. Oh, it's contours. Uh, it's just, it's, it's following, it's telling you when the values is starting to change. It's just contours associated to these values here. So it's telling you the, how much this function is, right? And so here it's pretty much constant, uh, equal to one, and then it starts decaying. So the, 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 um, the more dense the contours, the more that function is changing, right? More rapidly. Oh, here. Well, uh, it, it is a part. It's a, it's a, it's an interplay between uh, uh, going to. So it's an interplay between you crossing the scalaron and you entering a region in which acceleration kicks in. So I, I, I don't think I can give you an analytic uh, expression behind that. But that's the overall effect that you see is that. I mean, usually would, they would keep straight. But now the scales that close below K, the growth is announced. So the growth that would like to slow down here keeps going, right? So delta, del this ratio keeps being constant, so the contour is pushed. It's a very qualitative. <laughs> I don't think you can work it out. Yeah, maybe. I'm not sure. The one thing that I wanted to say, I mentioned quasi-static, so uh, I used the quasi-static approximation because I wanted to get some analytical insight and give you those expressions and understand that they were coming from having a Yukawa correction to your potential, so this fifth force. But you can do the full, numerically, you can do the, evolve the full dynamics. You don't need to resort to quasi-static approximation. So these plots that I'm showing have been obtained of uh, evolving the full dynamics. It's a tricky dynamics, the one to solve in FOR, but you can do it. Um, the other thing that I um, uh, should mention is that since you're changing uh, 
the way your growth, uh, your structure grows. Uh, similarly, I don't have the um, plot in the slides for that, but you can see that also the behavior of the metric potentials is different. They're not anymore strictly constant during matter domination, for instance. You start seeing a time dependence of those potential, and you know that as soon as uh, the metric potential depend on time, at late times, you pick up uh, the late ISW effect, uh, the integrated Saxof effect on your cosmic microwave background, right? Which are, I mean, you probably all know this very well, which are due to the fact that your photons are traveling through potential wells that are either becoming shallower or deeper through the time that the photon goes through them. And so overall, there is a shift in their energy, and uh, that shows up. Uh, it's, a, it's an effect that is relevant on the larger scales, so shows up at the low multiples of the cosmic microwave background. So that's where you can expect, uh, looking at cosmic microwave background, that's where you can expect most of the contribution from a FOVAR. Another important contribution that at the beginning was not very relevant, but now after Planck, it's quite uh, interesting, is on the smaller, way smaller scales, higher multiples, where CMB lensing starts to be important. So you need something where secondary anisotropies, because you're modifying your, uh, your theory at late times, you're modifying clustering, you're modifying lensing. Uh, so you can pick it up, uh, if you look at CMB, either here at ISW or down here on the, C on the CMB lensing. Uh, uh, tail. Here, of course, it's a bit hopeless because it's hidden in cosmic variance, um, but there's still uh, some constraint that you can put. Ah, here, yeah. Here I was, I forgot I had this plot. So here I was showing the lens in tail. This is exaggerated a little bit, but we are looking at different uh, uh, designer FOVAR models where uh, on different backgrounds, right? We first choose a lambda CDM background, then a WCDM. So, sorry, this is the standard, and these are the designer FOVAR. So if I compare red with dash black, I'm comparing a, la a pure lambda CDM model with an FOVAR on a lambda CDM background. And similar if you do this WCDM and designer WCDM. And I don't remember which value of F sub bar zero this corresponds to. I would guess 10 to the minus four, because you see quite strong effects. So, it's either that or uh, even bigger value. But it's just to show, I mean, uh, uh, of course, you're not allowed to have such, some of these big discrepancies, but it's just to show, as I was saying, the main effect, you see a lot of effects here in the ISWT. You do see quite some effect in the lensing, shown also here, um, and so on. So, okay, this summarizes what we have learned. Uh, a FOVAR has the freedom, once uh, you uh, make sure it obeys some viability condition, it has the freedom to reproduce more or less any expansion history. You can also basically get W equal to minus one or very close to minus one, but still uh, your growth of structure will be quite different. Uh, there is scale dependence and phi is not equal to psi anymore. And so that's what um, sort of made us think of uh, going after tests of gravity with a large scale structure by, by looking at relations between phi, psi, and delta, basically. And by looking at comparison of background probes and growth of structure probes to basically see um, the breaking of the consistency um, between uh, um, expansion history and growth rate. Uh, the other subtlety is that there is this uh, intrinsic scale dependence that you are injecting, and it happens uh, there is a transition scale. So you first live in a regime where everything is basically lambda CDM, and then you transition in a regime where you have a, a, an announcement of your clustering. Um, it's very difficult uh, to have your, uh, we don't know where that scale should lie, first of all, and we have good reason to expect that we will lie into the nonlinear, so the game is over. But let's say that it lies on, in some linear range of scales. It's very, uh, you should be very lucky if your set of data is going to pick exactly the transition. But what you can uh, instead hope of doing is of um, seeing some discrepancies between uh, um, measurements that come from observation at, that are looking at smaller scales and measurements that are telling you something about larger scales. 
If there is an F of R behind, you are probing two very different regimes. If it's a lambda CDM, you're probing the same regime, basically. Um, let me show, since uh, I, I kept saying that uh, because of local test uh, constraints on gravity, on F of R, we are typically pushed at having this uh, um, characteristic length scale of the scalar on being in the nonlinear, being uh, 10 megaparsec or less. So most of the interesting effects uh, and departures seem to be uh, bounded to happen in the nonlinear regime. And um, currently, the progress that has been done for studying that regime in FOR is mostly uh, using embodied simulations. There's a big group of people, and in particular here I'm showing some plots that you can find on the webpage of Gong Bo Zhao. He's one of the main players in embodied simulations of F of R and Chameleon more generally, and also they have some Weinstein uh, simulation for some Weinstein uh, models. There's Katsuya Koyama, Baujoli, and all those people um, that work on that since many years. This, you can go to his webpage, you, you find a lot of uh, nice stuff, but also the papers, they look very carefully at uh, the nonlinear power spectrum, also for the velocity field, and that's where they, uh, you see the main differences with respect to lambda CDM. They do it with full body, uh, full embody simulations in which they also model the screening. That's the important thing. I mean, at some point you go to highly nonlinear uh, regime and there the screening starts uh, coming into play. So I don't think, uh, uh, I cannot see much of a difference. <laughs> Maybe you have better vision. But so this is a snapshot, I think a Z equals zero, of a structure for, uh, out of a GR or an embodied simulation for GR. And here it is out of embodied simulation for different F of R models. Typically they are always set on a lambda CDM background. Sometimes they are Husavisky models. Um, this is telling you the length scale associated to the scalaron. Here you are very close to the uh, boundary with the nonlinear, and here you are breaking into the nonlinear. And it's showing the full simulation in which they take into account also the screening. It's a complicated thing. Uh, and there's some modeling, some approximations in there. Uh, in principle, there's stuff that, I mean, ellipso I, I haven't gotten to the point of describing what happens if you abandon spherical symmetry for the screening, but there's a strong dependence of the screening on the symmetry of your source. So if you go from a spherical symmetry, for instance, to an ellipsoidal source, uh, the screening becomes different be and uh, can weaken. Uh, you have a sort of lightning rod effect like in electromagnetism. So the more you squeeze your source, the screening will be very efficient on the two tips, but will uh, become very inefficient on the flatter part of your source. So there's a lot of things that you should take into account, for instance, ellipsoidal collapse, etc. But so I, I don't know, I don't see much of a difference, <laughs> but you, if you're interested in embodied simulation and on linear scales for FOR, you can dig in uh, in their resources, and, and in particular they have power spectra plot that might be way more, way more informative, especially for the velocity field. Here it's showing again full simulation and no chameleon uh, for FOR, again the three models that are the most popular three values for F sub R zero, and it's looking at the density field, at the scalaron, and at the potential. And you do see a little bit of a difference here, right? For the, that's where you can start picking up uh, the difference from a full simulation and the simulation that neglects the chameleon screening. If you look at the configuration for the scalaron, that's the only line in which I can notice a difference. Um, otherwise, I don't see much uh, of an impact, but I, 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 I do believe that it has an impact. Okay, so um, now let me move on to more general um, test of gravity. What do we mean when we say testing gravity with large scale structure and all these things such as Euclid and the LSST will be after dark energy, combining galaxy clustering and weak lensing, etc. So the idea is this one, again, Newtonian metric, uh, Newtonian gauge. Uh, we go beyond the probes of the expansion history. We want to combine these things because we want to probe the relation between delta phi and psi and in particular also the consistency with the, between growth rate and expansion history. This, I think I had it already, this slide. Uh, so it's just a recap. And this is a nice slide that um, 
of, from Rachel Bean, uh, where she gives a, an overview of different uh, ways of probing background, the growth up to some normalization, or the growth more directly, sort of uh, avoid of bias. And there's uh, a, a, a very nice uh, array of surveys that are out there already taking data or will be launched in the next years taking all uh, these different types of data and sort of providing us with an unprecedented uh, array of highly accurate large-scale structure data, background data, etc., with which, in principle, we can test besides lambda CDM and keep fitting its parameters. We can also try to explore alternatives around it and either convince us that it has to be lambda CDM or understand uh, what else it could be. So on the observational, from the observational side, I think we are uh, in great shape, at least from my point of view, because I don't deal with all the <laughs> nastiness <laughs> of uh, data. But I, I really trust uh, <laughs> people that collect data and, and uh, clean it into something nice like the spectra. So uh, I think we are doing great, and it will be a wonderful decade. But where do we stand on the theory side? And are we ready to explore lambda CDM, but also alternatives, right? And this is uh, what I usually show when I say that we are not ready. Uh, but I have already uh, shown this uh, zoo of models here. This is not the way we want to proceed. Of course, you can take a model, or, and in particular, it would be really desirable that you have a strong uh, theoretical argument in favor of a model. Then if you have a strong theoretical argument in favor of a model, yeah, you should go and fit it to all the data available. But we cannot keep popping up models like this uh, and fit them to data and, uh, and whatever, right? It's not really efficient. So what I want to talk about are these parameterized frameworks. And what I mean is something in which we sort of parameterize our ignorance about what else it could be, if not lambda, in a way that we can interface efficiently with data. Now, the first such uh, parameterized framework to uh, be used was this new and gamma. And I'll describe it. And it's uh, uh, very related to a FOVAR and what we have learned in the FOVAR. Then there came along things such as the trigger parameter that I have already mentioned, and I'll show a bit more about it. Uh, he, the difference you will see here is that you parameterize, um, we like to say that you parameterize the solutions of the equations of motion in the sense that you parameterize the relations between your variable, phi, psi, and delta. And you see whether uh, what you get out of the data is consistent with relations between these variables as in lambda CDM or as in your modified theory of gravity. But still, uh, you, the way you do parameterize this relation, I will show you, is in such a way that you have a full set of equations with which you can evolve your perturbations from early times all the way to today. So you can produce predictions for all observables. The, 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 the rationale behind this is a bit different. Uh, this is a so-called trigger parameter that says um, there are certain things, like the growth rate, for which I know a specific number that characterizes lambda CDM. Right? I argue that uh, in lambda CDM, that growth rate, F, is very well approximated at later times, where you pick up your observations, by this omega matter of a to the 6 over 11. So the idea is, I, I, I only take like Rashi space distortion data. And uh, well, I need something telling me about omega matter of a. But then I take those Rashi space distortion data, and I fit it. I fit to it omega matter of a to the gamma. If I get out gamma that is 6 over 11, fine, I have lambda CDM. If I get something else, then I have something that triggers my interest and makes me uh, go on and try to understand what else it is. But it, it's not um, a framework with which you can evolve equations. And uh, you just have a, a, a something that you're fitting to a specific set of data. And you shouldn't fit to CMB uh, because you are not evolving perturbations in a consistent uh, theory. And the other one that I'll talk about uh, more tomorrow, because it takes uh, at least a full lecture, but even more, is the so-called effective field theory of dark energy, uh, which is uh, heavily based on effective field theory of inflation. 
And the idea is, uh, if you want, that you parameterize your ignorance about uh, beyond and the CDM at the level of the action. So it's a sort of top down. Uh, you use strong symmetry arguments to build a, a generic action. And then you go down. And the nice thing of that is that if, since you start from the action, you can make predictions not only for scalar perturbations, but also for tensors. Instead, with this approach here, mu and gamma, uh, it's intrinsically born in the, in, the, in the realm of scalar perturbations, so you're stuck uh, with those observables. I like to see these three different approaches as being very phenomenological, very close to data. You can pull whatever large-scale structure tells you in there, and you will worry about theory later. This is just very close to a set of observation, and this is a more theoretical one. So uh, let me spend a few words about the trigger parameters, and in particular, the growth index. So I've already described it. There's some uh, previous work by Steinhardt and Wong, uh, but then there's, it has been revisited and sort of reformulated for um, test of gravity by Linder and Kahn later in 2007. And so commonly now this parameter gamma growth index goes often by the name Linder's gamma. <laughs> and um, so you will see things such as uh, uh, scientific um, goals of Euclid being formulated in terms of the accuracy with which Euclid will measure this parameter gamma, for instance. So it's a very popular parameter. You see a lot of literature in which it has been constrained. Again, it's just a parameterization of your growth rate. And the idea, what he wants to achieve is to disentangle things, the information that comes from background and goes into this omega meter of A, and then instead the actual modification that you do to the growth uh, to the rate of your growth that goes into gamma. So um, let me show a little bit of the math, uh, since there were some questions about typical forms of this. Um, so it's simpler if we define capital G as F minus 1. So instead of being D log, D, D log delta and D log A, let's take D log delta over A. We sort of factor out the linear growth characteristic of uh, meta domination lambda CDM. So then uh, we have the second order differential equation for um, delta, right, for the growing, um, for the growth of structure. I can rewrite it as a first order differential equation for my G. Uh, here I do it in logarithm of A, uh, which though the drawback that now it has, it is nonlinear. I have a quadratic, quadratic term in G. I can keep doing the algebra with G, but it's much simpler if I drop it. And uh, the, 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 the justification for dropping it is that G is uh, very close to zero. F is very close to one. Even if you modify it, you won't modify it. I mean, otherwise, you won't fit the data. So there, you cannot do something crazy. So let me drop capital G. And then it's an equation that is not too complicated. I can solve it by quadratures. And that's exactly where your omega meter to the gamma to the 6 over 11 comes if you solve this for lambda CDM, or you can do it even more generally for a W CDM background. You do some algebra, and using such expression for your Hubble uh, parameter, you will find that indeed uh, G is very well approximated by minus 1 plus omega meter to the gamma, with gamma being given by this expression. Well, this is the value of W um, at C equal 1. Now, um, the, um, you see this is a very small coefficient. W is whatever you do is still bounded to be very close to minus 1. So this is pretty negligible. Most of your background ef effect of changing the background goes into omega meter. So that's why I was saying that it's, it's gamma is mostly there to pick up clustering, uh, models that modify the clustering, not models that modify just the background, not minimally coupled quintessence, but non minimally coupled quintessence. Um, what happens if instead we have something like uh, what we have seen in F of R, that is a Poisson equation that changes, uh, has an overall rescaling, time and scale dependent rescaling of the Newton constant, let me call it mu. And we have seen that then your uh, equation for delta changes will have this scale dependence appearing in it. So you can repeat the same algebra, but you have to be careful that here now you have this mu. 
And uh, of course, again, you drop this, but of course this mu will enter in your uh, integral. So it's very complicated to predict, to give an analytical expression now for uh, the growth rate. Uh, of course, the first thing that you notice is that it, is, it will be scale dependent, uh, sometimes to a negligible extent, sometimes not to a negligible extent. But still, I mean, there is a scale dependence in here. Besides, there is also a different time dependence, which is typically complicated. You don't have an analytical expression for it. You can work a little bit around for some specific models. So this I took it out from the paper by Linder and Kahn where they work it out for DGP. DGP is this Dvaliga badadze porati model in which you have a five-dimensional theory of gravity. And um, it turns out that there's no scale dependence in this model, but still there is a very different time dependence. I don't remember, but the, the, the overall result of this is something different from 6 over 11 at late times. This is a toy model that they made up to mimic what you expect in standards in scalar tensor theory, so it's sort of a FOVAR. Now, it's, there's a lot of modeling, toy modeling, but, and this is also, again, would bring inside some non-trivial scale dependence if you want to be very uh, picky, because this is the ratio between phi and psi. So it's a very complicated object. So gamma um, can be, I mean, you see where the problem is. Uh, besides, the, the fact that there is some problem in the pipeline that goes from the raw data of the of Reshi space distortion to giving to you a, grow, a growth rate, and there is some model dependence and the way in which you treat the scales in there, uh, which is tricky. But let's say we have a, a set of um, measurements for F sigma 8. Um, you can fit omega meter to the gamma, but you have to make a choice for the gamma when you fit it to the data. You can assume gamma constant. You can assume some uh, polynomial expansion of gamma in time. That's what the most people have done. I don't think there has ever been a fit of gamma with the scale dependence um, to the growth rate. And of course, the results of your analysis depend on your assumption on the parameterization. So it's always to be taken with a grain of salt. Um, now, uh, these are just some examples. I should update these plots. It's, they're very old. Um, this is from 2015. Just some examples of contour plots uh, for sigma 8 and gamma or omega meter and gamma from different experiments. Here you have Planck, and here you have a combination of clusters, galaxies, CMB. So they are all differently uh, uh, dependent, and uh, so it's good to combine them. You can learn something. And there you are on spot, of course, of the 6 over 11, which is roughly 0 0.55 value for gamma. Okay, now there is another gamma, and uh, that's the gamma of the other framework that I want to discuss. Um, and that's why we often call the other one, the one of the growth index, uh, Linder's gamma, to, to distinguish it with this other gamma. Sorry. Um, now, what is this uh, framework? And I think you have seen, uh, if you care at all about tests uh, of uh, modified gravity, dark energy, and whatever, you have seen in, any pap in some papers you must have encountered these functions. If not, I'll tell you the other names under which you have encountered them. So the idea, as I said already, is inspired by FOVR, but then other models of modified gravity where we have seen that if we focus on modifications on the uh, gravity part of the action, you don't touch the matter action, then these equations will remain the same but you do see modifications to your Poisson and anisotropy equation. Now, uh, let me tell you that there can be the case in which you stick to GR, so you don't modify the gravity part of the action, but you introduce a coupling, for instance, between dark matter and dark energy. That's what is typically called no minimally coupled dark energy. That, of course, will give you a source term in here, will change your uh, uh, Euler and continuity equation, but there is a way, at least for standard no minimally coupled dark energy model, uh, then Rogerio will ask about non-universal coupling and <laughs> let's assume universal coupling for simplicity or let's say that even if it's not universal, I only care about cold dark matter. I don't care less, I cannot care less about baryons. So uh, I can reabsorb that source into a, a, a effectively a, a, a modify mu and gamma, okay? So it's not the most general thing, but it's pretty broad. Now, I'm just writing very blindly. I'm being very, uh, very ignorant and just writing that 
yes, I know that the equations will be modified. We have learned also that they will be higher order because there's an extra scalar degree of freedom. Uh, so they will be horribly complicated, but at the end of the day, the outcome is that the relation between these five psi and delta will be modified in a time and scale dependent way. This is all these functions are telling you. So it's forgetting about all the complicated details of how your theory actually modifies and assuming that there are these functions. The way you have built this, it's very similar to the way in which you introduce W, the, the equation of state for dark energy, and you say it's minus one in lambda CDM and it may be a function of time in any other model. Similarly here, mu and gamma are one in lambda CDM, time and scale independent, and they are typically something different from that in modified models. Now, I'm, I've given you the original simpler version that was back in 2008 when we were uh, uh, working this out and uh, we neglected for a moment, we neglected the uh, shear from neutrinos because we were really focusing on, uh, we weren't doing this with Einstein-Boltzmann solvers, we were mostly focusing on uh, just growth of structure, so evolving the five equations for delta, phi, psi, whatever, simple stuff. And so we neglected the shear of neutrinos. Now there is a, 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 a modern version of this uh, framework, uh, but it's more or less the same. Again, you're parameterizing such relation between phi, psi, and delta, but in a way, in such, in such a way that you are careful with the shear of neutrinos, because what would happen otherwise is that you would see a mu and gamma different from one just because of the fact, at early times, just because of the fact of neutrinos. And here we are reabsorbing it in such a way that in the standard scenario, they're really one. Uh, but okay, so if you open the code that is known as MGCAMB, I think I have a slide uh, about that. MGCAMB is the code in which we implemented this mu and gamma, and now the version is such that um, you have that. Okay, so they're very broad, mu and gamma. It's basically you are totally ignorant, uh, but still, uh, uh, you have created, even though it doesn't look like from the way I've defined them, uh, you can uh, turn those uh, definitions of mu and gamma in such a way that you implement them uh, as modifications to your equation in the Einstein-Boltzmann solver, for instance. You can, trans first of all, you have typically to translate, if you work with CAM, but you have to translate from Newtonian gauge to synchronous gauge. It's a little bit tricky, but you can do it and you have a set of modified Einstein equations that you enter in your code. So you have a set of equations with which you can evolve your perturbations from early time till today. And, and then ideally, uh, of course you will have to make a choice and I will get to that. You have to make a choice for mu and gamma. But ideally then you have predictions, you compare them with data and whatever the data tell you, uh, you put it into this mu and gamma. Uh, SW, the first thing that you can do is a sort of consistency check of lambda CDM. Uh, if you find that mu and sigma, uh, mu and gamma are one, then, <laughs> then <laughs> maybe you stop. Um, uh, but you can do, try to do more, and especially you, you might want to make sure that you meaningfully explore alternatives. So um, I told you that you, I, I'm pretty sure many of you have seen this function. If you haven't seen them as mu and gamma, you might have encountered capital sigma, which is the, my, it's preferable over gamma. Uh, capital sigma is defined similar to, similarly to how mu is defined, just in terms of the lensing potential. It's preferable because in, if you combine mu with sigma, now you are going to have mu that is sensitive mostly to galaxy clustering, because it enters in the equation for psi, so peculiar velocities and galaxy clustering and sigma, which is mostly sensitive to weak lensing. So the idea is that you can break, you can learn something, break the generalities between those functions. Gamma is not really, there's a, a, there's a big debate about that, and I won't say much more because now I remember that I'm on video. But gamma is, is not really, um, it's not so neatly connected to an observable. Okay, there's a lot of uh, dirtiness that you need to, uh, do in order to go from whatever you observe to uh, inferring something about uh, gamma. If you haven't seen mu, sigma, or gamma, you have encountered G meter or G light just because they rescale the Newton constant entering, if you want, in your geodesics for meter and for light. Very old 
Uh, so probably you haven't seen it, but well, at the beginning, in 2007 or so, when we were playing with these things, some other people, Caldwell, Mercury, chose another letter, which I cannot pronounce. I don't remember what it was, but for gamma, you might have seen that. Or if you open Planck's paper, um, I'm not sure whether to make it, to distinguish it from the gamma of the growth factor, but they prefer eta. It's exactly the same function, okay? It's the gravitational slip, so-called. Uh, so if you, whatever, nowadays people mostly use mu sigma or eta. So all Planck's paper, for instance, have that. All we cleansing paper or DES paper, Keats paper, etc. they do mu and sigma. Um, you need only two of those. If, as long as you stick to linear perturbations, linear scalar perturbations, of course, I'm no, I don't know anything about the tensors because I've just parametrized in relation between the scalars. You need only do, two, two functions and you have your full set of equations. Now, one uh, uh, question that would arise is that you might be familiar with this uh, conservation of the curvature perturbation on super horizon scales. Um, there is an equation, this one, that you can get out in many different ways. You can get it out simply also by looking at Einstein equation, in particularly the um, spatial diagonal one in the super horizon limit. Or you can do an iter work look, working with the curvature perturbation on hypersurfaces of uniform density, uh, which typically in, in, uh, in, uh, in models that are not too contrived corresponds also to the uh, commoving curvature perturbation. And that's the quantity that you are familiar with in inflation. It's something that is conserved on super horizon scales as long as your perturbations are adiabatic. Uh, there's many different ways. One approach that I like very much is the so-called parallel universes approach. Uh, that shows you that basically this uh, equation for the conservation of uh, the commoving um, curvature uh, in presence of adiabatic perturbations is uh, just a consistency um, bound. It's a bound that you get from the consistency, uh, consistency of your super horizon equation, um, um, perturbations and the background expansion history. So there's a wonderful paper by Wons, Malik, and other people, which, uses, which shows the conservation of this in many different ways. But it's very nice because they show it that it doesn't depend on your theory of gravity. They derive it by just by using conservation of the energy momentum tensor, which in all these theories that we have been looking at holds. They derive it using the parallel universes approach, which again doesn't depend on your theory of gravity. So we know that whatever we do, if, unless it's too, ra it's too radical, uh, whatever we do, all the theories that I've shown you so far have to respect this conservation of curvature perturbation. So we can play with mu and, uh, and, and gamma um, on linear scales, but we have to make sure that if we go towards super horizon scales, one of the two functions have to drop out. Because uh, this, you can take this conservation of the curvature perturbation and write it as a second order differential equation for phi and psi. There's a beautiful paper by Ed Bershinger in 2008 uh, discussing exactly the implications of this equation for test of gravity. So there's no, you don't have freedom on large scales. Um, you don't have freedom for two functions. You can at most modify the, the ratio between phi and psi. And then you have an equation that you have to obey. So the, the one check that we had to do when introducing this uh, parametrization mu and gamma was to make sure that we don't um, ruin uh, this conservation because it shouldn't, all the theories that we were parametrizing have to obey it. And you can combine the equations and take its super horizon limit and express everything in terms of psi. And it turns out that yes, indeed, you are left mostly with things that depend on gamma. So you have one free function. Whatever terms were contributed by mu, uh, as expected because it was entering in the clustering equation, uh, become pretty negligible. I didn't, it was in the first slide, in the other slide, but P here for us is just sort of telling you whether you are super or sub horizon, okay? It's a ratio of K over AH. So on, sub, on super horizon scales, you expect P to be pretty small. And it turns out that unless you're mu and gamma, unless you do a very uh, silly choice of mu and gamma, you make them 
uh, enormous and whatever, especially at large scales, you should be safe. You shouldn't mess up with this conservation of um, curvature perturbations, which is a nice uh, thing to know. Okay, MGCAMB, I have already mentioned it. Uh, if you are ever interested in uh, uh, using MGCAMB, it's still widely used, especially by Planck, in part, uh, if, uh, for instance. Uh, the person to contact is, oh, what is it? It's not here because it's not, um, it was not among the first authors, but the person to contact is Alex Zucca. Although, actually, he left the field, so <laughs> he's in finance now, so maybe <laughs> But no, but he's still active a little bit. I uh, just, just left the field because he was in Vancouver and they have some wonderful companies that pay you a lot of money if you go in finance. So, but yeah, so um, this is a code that you might have seen. Uh, it has been used a, a lot by Planck to put constraint on mu and sigma, or mu and gamma, or eta. Okay, now um, let me show you some... Uh, constraints, what we have learned about these functions, but then I, I, I want to argue also about the shortcomings of this approach, because then it's a sort of motivation for tomorrow's lecture. So, okay, very nice. You are totally um, general, agnostic. You have these two functions. You don't care about the details or how they depend on time and scale, and you ideally fit them to data, except that you cannot ideally just fit to generic functions to data. You have to make some choices for this function. You have to somehow parameterize them. And so what do you do? The simplest thing that you can do, which is the most popular by now, is you just completely neglect the fact that they could be scale dependent, and you only model their time dependence. And the most popular way of modeling their time dependence is by attaching it to the dark energy effect at the background level, because the idea is I go from early time when I have basically GR, and then dark energy starts picking up, and eventually I will also see modifications in the structure, right? So there, this has been heavily in use, and uh, you will see a lot of plots telling you about constraint on mu zero, or similarly gamma or sigma. Some people have attempted to do a transition in redshift, uh, the other thing that you can do if you want to try to model the scale dependence is to go to the quasi-static regime because we have seen that in that regime, as I argue, uh, you have this ratio of polynomial in K squared. So that's another thing that has been also fit to data. You can try to be more general. Uh, it's a very cumbersome exercise. We have done it for a couple of years. And uh, it's by using the so-called principal component analysis approach. Uh, you might have encountered it in different things, also such as data analysis. The way we want to use it in this context is uh, you say, I don't really know anything about mu and, uh, and gamma. Um, they are, I don't know, they will be a function of time. I have my redshift window for my data, I don't know, 0, 2. And I just create beans and I associate mu1, mu2, etc. a given value, constant value, to my function in that bin. And this will be a lot of new parameters that I want to fit to data. I can do it in two dimensions. I add k. I have a given range of scales relevant for my survey. And then I create pixels. And inside each of these pixels, I give it a value to the function. And then I fit all these uh, new parameters to the data. It's a very difficult exercise. Uh, it's informative, especially if you do it at the level of, uh, if you do a forecast before, so you can learn um, the sensitivity of your um, experiment. If you do a Fisher forecast with such a binning, you can learn the sensitivity of your experiment to variations of this function. You can learn how many degrees of freedom of this function you will be able to constrain. You can learn the so-called sweet spots, so the regions in time and space where your data will be mostly sensitive to variations of this function and so on. So there's a lot that you can do, but it's also, of course, you have many parameters. It's very difficult to constrain them. You have a tail of noisy modes, etc. So I'm not going to go into that. I just want to show some things that we have, uh, that you might find in the literature. I've, mu and C, this mu and gamma approach and whatever has been heavily used to, uh, to test f of r. And what people do, and uh, it's also in MGCAMB, you uh, <coughs> implement this 
characteristic form for mu and gamma that is what the one that we have derived in f of r, right? And then you give, you choose your model, your background model, either analytically or with the designer approach. And then you evolve. You have to be, you have to remember that you are in the quasi-static regime because you are using the expressions for mu and gamma that come out of your quasi-static approximation. Um, yeah, you can learn something. Uh, there, are, there are constraints that have been put on uh, f of r using this approach. Actually, most of, I would say 90% of the constraints that you find in the literature on f of r, on the B0, have been put using this approach. Modeling f of r, either with a designer, typically they, they choose lambda CDM expansion history, build the designer f of r, put it into the P, mu and gamma, and then uh, put constraints. So that's what happens typically if you see a constraint on f of r. Uh, other collaboration, this is back in the year, CFHT lens, uh, um, and this is just people playing and uh, comparing the peculiar velocity with lensing and their combined effect on constraining mu and sigma. What I want to highlight from these plots are two things. One that, uh, as expected, just because of the way this function mu and sigma are built, uh, you can break the degeneracies, right? I mean, you expect weak lensing data to mostly constrain uh, sigma and clustering data to mostly constrain mu. There's the magnification bias and those things, so it's not an exact... Uh, and it also, uh, similarly, peculiar velocity, you expect to, be, uh, the, to break some degeneracies in the mu and sigma plane with respect to uh, lensing, but it all depends a lot on the parametrization that you use. So this is the constraint that you will get on mu and sigma today if you model them as linear function of the scale factor. This is if you model them as a to the cube. So it's, I mean, you have always to be careful whenever you put constraints on the fact that they depend on your assumptions behind it. And this is... Yes, that's what uh, my lecture will be about tomorrow. Yes, that's the theoretical guy. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but yeah, but I'll, I'll talk also about how com to combine them to get the theoretical guidance. So that's exactly the direction in which we should go. I mean, sigma is still very good because it's the simplest interface with data, but you do want to have guidance indeed. So um, this just, this, uh, I don't know if year three is out, no, right? <laughs> uh, this is uh, just um, some results of this, I'm not sure, I don't remember how they parameterized, but it was some power law in, or either power law, or sometimes it's a um, Taylor expansion, a la CPL, and you marginalize on the coefficients that is linear in the scale factor. So, pretty consistent with uh, lambda CDM, of course, you might have um, a fit to data bed uh, parametrization, so your data goes, runs back to lambda CDM. So that's the game also, right? You have to be careful. Um, similarly, results from Planck, uh, it was in 2015, uh, it was the first time uh, that a collaboration such as Planck had a, a dedicated paper to constra on constraints to dark energy and modify gravity. So they try to go beyond constraints on W, the equation of state, and explore different ways of constraining modified gravity or dark energy. They had some specific models, and they had also constraints on mu and sigma, or mu and eta, the, the shear, right? And yeah, you can, I mean, there's nothing uh, uh, so exciting about this, except it's some of the first contours that we see. You see that they change a little bit depending on which data set you combine, and uh, of course, you expect a different uh, shape uh, if you go and look at mu and sigma. Um, the thing that I want to highlight, bes besides that, as usual, there's a dependence on the parametrization, um, is also that um, at this, if you see this plot, people in the, dark, in the modified gravity community was getting already excited at thinking, oh, okay, so which theory is behind there, right? So Planck is giving a whatever, one or uh, one point, I don't know, 2.1, whatever sigma, irrelevant sigma uh, departure from the lambda CDM value. Um, you can play that game, 
but uh, you should also look at the other plot, which is the one uh, which brings, um, which uses CMB lensing, and contours go back. So there's still uh, uh, mostly some internal things with the lensing of CMB to be solved. Uh, and also, I mean, there's no significance at all in terms of sigma before we jump and uh, play the game of modify gravity. Uh, Planck, I think, was also one of the first that tried to um, look at the scale dependence. Uh, they parameterize it. There's a whole different chapter of things to discuss about the way they parameterize the scale dependence. But, uh, of course, they chose the ratio of polynomial in k square. And uh, <coughs> the outcome is sort of expected. Your contours broaden. We are not ready yet um, to pick to pick up any scale dependence. In particular, I think we are not, we cannot hope of picking up scale dependence with a single probe. I mean, uh, maybe combining with weak lengthy measurements, but just with CMB. But still uh, nice to do the exercise. The other question is, okay, this scale dependence is a pain in the neck, and I can model it only if I go to quasi-static approximation. And um, I've already basically, I, I, I have already spoiled the results because I have already stressed that we expect a ratio of polynomials in K. But let me show the general argument behind that. Um, so, of course, we need K, uh, to do the quasi-static approximation eventually because I want to do something analytical. But let me start from a very general action. Uh, let me say that I don't care about uh, ghosts and, and anything. I, I can run into ghosts for a moment. I don't, I don't worry. So I don't bother about Ostrograsky or what Loblock has told me. And I write a Lagrangian, a covariant Lagrangian that enjoys locality in terms of whatever comes to my mind, in terms of all geometric invariants that I can build and, uh, and that are independent and in terms of scalar fields, whatever I want, how many I want. At the end of the day, if I look at scalar perturbations and in the linear regime, uh, what can you expect for your Einstein equations? You can expect to have some operators with time and spatial derivatives acting on your, metric, on your two metric potentials and on your whatever, how many scalar fields you have, perturbations to your scalar field. There's nothing else that can happen to your equations, right? Then how high you go in derivatives uh, and whether you have even or only, uh, you have also odd um, coefficients here, depend on your theory, depend if you're in inserting vector modes, etc. But this is a very uh, uh, obvious way of writing those equations. The, here there are still operators. That's why I'm using the hat because I want to think of them as a, as a combination of uh, spatial and time derivatives possibly, or only spatial, only time, and whatever order. And then I do the usual magic uh, quasi-static approximation. So I go on sub-horizon, and I also neglect the time dependencies of, of all scalar fields. And uh, uh, so the result is that all those operators that I had, I mean, I'm dropping all time derivatives, <laughs> and so what you are left with is just powers of k. And in particular now, if uh, I can keep going general, eh? if you, we have this paper when, where we stay general, we didn't specialize to what is down here, and you can look at what you get for mu and gamma in the general case, uh, but you will get that they are a ratio of polynomials in K uh, with coefficients that depend on time, K to the N, Uh, where uh, if your theory involves only scalar fields, these coefficients here can be only even. You cannot introduce odd powers of k unless you put vector modes in your theory. And if you want your scalar, if you want to have one single scalar field that obeys second order equation of motion, n and m will be at most two. So basically they can be zero or two. And that's what we have seen uh, in a FOVAR and in general in scalar tensor theory. Multi-scalar fields, you can go, you cannot get, you cannot activate odd powers of K, but you can go to uh, K to the fourth and whatever. But so uh, quite uh, generically for scalar tensor theories, you go back to this ratio of 
uh, even square, even quadratic and even polynomials in K. And then uh, uh, there's another thing that comes out of this exercise, which is a thing that the Planck paper forgot about, um, which is that you are bounded to have the denominator of gamma being equal to the numerator of mu. That's uh, unless you do something very, I think any Hordeski and those type of theories will have to do that. And so you have, you, that allows you to reduce a little bit the number of free functions of time. There's still five free functions of time. But um, so in, 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 in the part in which they model the scale dependence, they forgot about um, this uh, relation. Uh, so, ah, yeah. So um, this was a generic result uh, and specialized to uh, scalar tensor. It was going down to this and then realizing that in, ge in general, but then if you do it in this case, it reduces to five because of this uh, denominator is being equal to the numerator. And uh, yeah, it was Levon uh, Pogosian. We were working and got very excited because before Hordeski did the painting about his action, so this is back in 2013, eh? He had, of course, he's a painter, right? He had many painters, and he has this painting that is called Talking About Gravity. And Levon goes, look, there are five trees. So Hordensky knew already that you know only five, you need only five functions of time <laughs> to model. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, okay, I'm almost done. Um, there's a lot that has been done and keeps been doing. Uh, being done for test of gravity with this mu and gamma, mu and sigma, whatever framework. It is very good framework because it's very flexible. Uh, it, it has a very direct contact with data. You can pull whatever data tells you in there. Uh, you don't have to make um, very stringent uh, assumptions uh, in terms of which classes of theories you are looking at. Uh, but of course, there are drawbacks. Uh, the first thing is that you are very far uh, from theory, exactly because you are not making much assumptions and you are not worrying that much about vi conditions of viabilities of your theory, etc. You might waste a lot of time, and I will show you tomorrow, in exploring regions of this mu and sigma plane that don't make any sense from the theoretical point of view. It's very similar to what happens with W. Uh, w. Uh, you know, we are very used now at seeing constraint on W in terms of W0 and WA. And uh, typically, the whole W0 and WA plane is fit to the data, um, neglecting the fact that there is a famous phantom divide that you, cannot, you can cross, but you cannot cross in certain classes of model. So, um, people sometimes forget, and now nowadays data tend to go exactly in the so-called phantom region of W0WA. It's not phantom necessarily for models, for more complicated models of gravity, but it is a phantom region, the W equal minus one, for simple like quintessence, single field, uh, minimally coupled models. So it's always good to keep in mind what are viable regions from the theoretical point of view. And it's even more dangerous with mu and sigma or mu and gamma. You can waste a lot of time into regions that wouldn't make any sense from the theoretical point of view. So that's, that goes back to the question, and I'll show you tomorrow how we can try to clean up and, and build some guidance, still trying to be very general, not too model dependent, some guidance for which regions to explore, but also, importantly, which features to expect in mu sigma, at which redshift, at which scale, etc. And the other uh, point that I want to make is that uh, since I build, we, are, we have built this framework in terms of scalar perturbations, I've given up on the tensor sector. And it might have been okay 10 years ago, it's not okay anymore now. Uh, besides CMB polarization uh, becoming more and more a reality uh, from the data point of view, we have gravitational waves that have been uh, detected and we have seen that that puts uh, some compl strong complementary constraint on uh, gravity. So we want to be able to uh, exploit also this type of data. And just a few minutes of spoiler uh, for how I think uh, we can do that and to motivate you either to do not come or to come. I'm not sure what's <laughs> the outcome. I actually, it will be the first lecture tomorrow because then I'm flying off. So I'll swap with Marco.
so that you know. Because you don't come for Mark and find me. <laughs> Um, no, so uh, kidding aside, so tomorrow I want to talk about this. Um, it's uh, the so-called effective field theory of dark energy. Now, there's a lot of theory behind this. You have already uh, heard uh, whenever you talk about effective field theory, right? Now you're talking about effective field theory of electric structure, which is a different thing. But whenever you talk about effective field theory, there's a very cumbersome theory behind this. And I'll try to give a flavor a little bit. Also today in the colloquium, I will briefly talk about it. Um, but um, the way we um, are using it in the context of cosmological test of gravity is a very practical way. Okay? It's a parametrized framework, as I told you before. Now I'll, tell, I'll tell you tomorrow exactly what all these objects here are. You can see that there are some geometrical quantities. I'm doing a sort of ADM decomposition of the matrix, so I'm looking at spatial, whatever, I will do it tomorrow. But um, so the thing is that I am parametrizing my ignorance about what I can have beyond the Ricci scalar and the cosmological constant, so a lambda that doesn't depend on time. If I want, of course, I have to set some rules, right? I mean, I have to decide some guiding principle that I don't want to give up. So uh, once I put those guiding principles in place, um, there's a finite number of terms that I can write in this action, in particular if I uh, stop at the quadratic level, and I stop at the quadratic level because I want to study linear perturbations. Of course, I, this is not the, the way to go if you want to break into the nonlinear regime. You, you should keep going in orders of perturbations, and I mean, it's uh, slightly hopeless. But so uh, there's a finite number, and I'll show you that it's even less than uh, the functions that are here highlighted in red. Here are, I have how many? Two, four, six, eight. There's less. There's five. Not surprisingly, we expected five. It goes back to the five functions of time that we found in mu and sigma. But so the idea is I now have a, an action, and I'm, what am I doing? I'm going beyond lambda, the cosmological constant either making it dynamical, giving it a kinetic term. I'll show you why I call this the kinetic term. And no minimal coupling. And that's the regime. The first line is all you would get if you do generalized Brandicki. So if your theory has a, non has a, a standard kinetic term. Uh, then you start going in the realm characteristic of Galileons and Weinstein mechanisms, etc. So you start having less trivial kinetic term. But let's look at it as uh, a parameterization of my ignorance. What do I have next? Nothing. So a parameterization of uh, my ignorance at the level of the action, and there's a couple of um, good things that you get out of this, which is uh, the fact that you can now treat simultaneously scalar and tensors. Uh, the same theory, and that is uh, very important, right? Because that's what, we were, what happened with us, uh, to us with the uh, gravitational waves. We were playing in the scalar in the sector of large-scale structure, and then that other uh, measurement comes and uh, swipes away many models. So in this, uh, with this approach, you treat simultaneously. You start from an action, you go down, you can get scalar, vector, and tensor, vector who cares, and then you have scalar and tensors. Um, so there's a lot that you can uh, get out of there. And the other thing that I will uh, uh, show, uh, and goes back to the guidance, is that uh, since I have this action, I can make a stability analysis. I can expand in, uh, in, uh, in, in the perturbations. Of course, I want to open it up in the terms of the metric components. I expand in the perturbations, and then I can look at the resulting action for my propagating degrees of freedom. And I know there are some conditions. There can be more. Some are everybody agree on, on the, agrees on the conditions. Some other are under debate, whatever. I can keep. Um, imposing certain conditions of viability, like for instance, I don't want a, fun, a theory that is phantom that develops a ghost, etc. And that puts st strong constraint on these free functions of time. And I'll show you first how we constrain those functions, and then how those constraint projects on the phenomenological plane of mu sigma and w. And so that's the whole idea. Uh, to use this framework to explore theory and whatever I'm uh, allowed to do from basic fundamental physics, but then project it as sort of masks, theoretical masks, uh, on my phenomenological function with which I interface uh, 
uh, with that. And I think I'll stop here for today. With respect to f of r, uh, is there some uh, choices of parameter to the Husavitsky one <laughs> that does not indicate an enhancement in growth and also lensing, or f of r will al always enhance growth and lensing? f of r uh, will always, I think f of r will always enhance growth and lensing. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that, um, so uh, the, the ISW tail might behave uh, a bit different. No, I think uh, viable for var yeah, are bounded also to give uh, uh, the, I, the correction to the ISW in uh, in uh, in one direction, either lower or upper. Uh, I think they, there's a nice paper indeed by Wen Hu, where it shows that uh, yes, you can in principle with f of r models go either upper or lower in the low multiple of the CMB, mm -hmm. uh, but um, the two regions correspond to that f sub r zero or b zero parameter being positive or negative. And, and the negative one is ruled out by stability. So yeah, I think uh, f of r, uh, the general, for the general Ordensky, uh, is still uh, under debate. And I think there are cases in which you can, especially if you play with the kinetic terms, the non-trivial kinetic terms, you can suppress the growth, even if you have this additional scalar field, right? But I think f of r, there's no. But for the. General Hordesky or General Bransdick case that you mentioned? Because General uh, Bransdick case, I. Yeah, the Hordesky, for instance, no slip, gravity can. Yeah, uh, Hordesky, you can. Uh, yeah, yeah. Or they, so well, I mean, at some point people argue also that with Hordesky you cannot get any. I mean, the first argument one would say, okay, you have uh, your tensor and you add an, a scalar degree of freedom that mediates a fifth force, okay, you announce clustering. It's also trivial, right? I mean, because the scalar degree of freedom has an. an typically, I think you need a non trivial kinetic term. The G3, like the couple. For instance, yeah, yeah like or that, that you get in kinetic gravity braiding and things like that, yeah. When you were talking about gamma and mu, you said that it may be interesting to use PCA so that you can find maybe a better clue on the parameterizations of these two mm -hmm. functions. but. How do you do that? Because um, I'm used to PCA in the observables, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So how can you do that? Um, so you can uh, um, you can bin them, right? You, we typically do that at the level of forecast. So we choose an experiment. Uh, you can bin those functions. You build your Fisher matrix. And then you diagonalize it, and you find the principal components. Okay? And uh, that, uh, the, the information that you get out of those, uh, by looking, for instance, at the signals to noise of these principal components, uh, is, first of all, how many of those you expect to be able to constrain. So roughly tells you, I will be able to constrain one degree of freedom of this function, three degrees of freedom. So does it make sense to model it, right? And it also shows you, typically, uh, the regions in time or scale uh, where your experiment is picking up features. Because of, if you look at the, uh, at the first eigenmodes of these functions that you have built, uh, you see where they have a feature. So it's telling you those are the so-called sweet spots. And it, so it, you can use it as a sort of guidance on uh, how you to parameterize. Yeah. Um, is there a program such as MGCOM for treating both uh, tensor and scalar perturbations? So if it, there is a? Problem. If there is a code such as MGCOM for ah. treating the, the tensor perturbations also? I mean, uh, yes, you can get the tensor. I mean, you can, you can get it out of MGCOM, right? But uh, the thing is that we, we don't modify it. So if you run MGCOM, we are only modifying the, uh, and you do s some choices for this mu and gamma, you are just modifying the scalar sector. OK, uh, so uh, tensors, you just ev evolve them. And on linear scales, it's, um, they're separate, right? So and you just evolve them in the standard way. So you're not le learning much, except some effects through the background. 
because you modify your expansion history. But you're not picking up any true effect of your modified theories of gravity. Now, if you do it for a FOVAR, a FOVAR has a very mild effect on the tensor at linear level. It affects slightly the, the, the friction term in your equations for the, um, for the tensors. It's something that you won't really uh, see that much, but for other models. And the same warning, so if you use MGCAM, you find also, of besides you can use mu and gamma, uh, you find also the option of the linders. But there you have to be even more careful, because besides the fact that you're not treating tensor, you are, I mean, you are not modifying, considering modifications to the tensors, you are also sort of taking a parameter that was built only for your growth rate and somehow in, uh, incorporating in your equations, but this will mostly mean a modified mu, and it is not telling anything to you about what you expect for gamma. So when people run MGCAMB to put constraint on gamma, and they use CMB and other things combined with growth rate, etc. they are implicitly, sorry, there's <laughs> gamma linder and gamma, they are implicitly assuming that this gamma is one. They set it to one. So it's a, it's a restricted set of theories that you're looking at in reality. You're looking at a set of theories that modify clustering while not introducing any anisotropic stress. So it's, uh, you have always to be a little bit careful when you use it in that setup. Yeah. But maybe high class can deal with uh, tensor modes. I'm not sure. What? High class can also deal with tensor modes. Yeah, but modes. also EFT cam can deal with tensor modes. <laughs> <And also laughs> EFT, show you sorry, and also <laughs> EFT cam. So there are codes that can. There are codes. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. There are codes that yeah, can yeah, deal yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, not MG cam, but EFT cam and uh, high class. High class, yes, as well. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, with respect to the uh, parameterization proportional to the fraction density of dark energy, it has sh been shown that it is suitable for early times, but it's not well suited for like late times. Late. It should be the opposite, I think. I ah, know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's the opposite. But it's similar to W, right? Also W, the CPL. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so they share the same problem, sort of. So yeah. when, for instance, DS or Planck or everybody, everyone else using such parameterization to constrain think, the data yeah. will I, lead to. Uh, I think I'm not sure. I think uh, they probably uh, put it to they put those function to one up to a given redshift when they turn on the modifications, a later redshift. So they keep mu and gamma fixed to the GR value at early times, and then they turn on uh, the modification. I would think. Um, so, yeah, it's not a good parameterization. <laughs> okay, so I don't see uh, more questions, so let's thank uh, Sandra again. <laughs> and uh, I see you at the uh, colloquium at 2, 2 p.m. Okay. <laughs> again. Here, <all> over again. <laughs>